scientists that we are uh, speaking with really now are saying that past conditions around the Great Lakes are no longer a reliable basis for decision making that'll carry us into the future. And I'll give you a little bit of uh, data here to back that up, but we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. We will be happy to do some climate change webinars in the future uh, where we can dig into a lot more detail on the information that I'll pre present with you uh, this evening. So back in 1884, this is what the, the world's temperatures looked like when compared against the average temperature from 1884 through 2020. So if you look at the, the world, it was predominantly cooler than the average temperature that we've experienced over that last century. But this time period now is much hotter than the average temperature over the last century. And we see the last six years have been the hottest ever on record. And of course, 2020 looks like it's well on track to be, again, one of the top two or three hottest years ever on record. So that trend is continuing. And that's a lot of extra energy that's up in the atmosphere now uh, that's having an impact. Now, when we talk or when you hear about this number in the press, you usually hear about the global average. And since 1948, that's increased by about 0.8 degrees Celsius. But Canada, in that same time period, is experiencing an amplification that happens as you go up towards the poles. From the equator to the pole, there's about a three times multiplier on the way that those temperatures are impacted. And if you've seen anything in the news recently about the fires and heat waves up in Siberia, north of the Arctic Circle, you'll understand that. So in Canada, we've seen an increase of about 1.7 degrees Celsius. <coughs> Excuse me. And that means that we are starting to see these hotter temperatures move into our Great Lakes region. And that's going to have many different impacts that we'll just touch on today. But imagine temperatures of uh, telling somebody 40 or 50 years ago that Timmins was gonna reach a, a humidex of 39 degrees. Uh, that was pretty remarkable. My family's from uh, Northern Ontario and, and that would have been something they would have laughed at. Uh, so effectively what was no longer is. And in order for us to think about how we can protect our families and our properties and enjoy our experience of uh, Georgian Bay going forward, we need to, to take in this information. We have measured the increase in water temperature in Lake Michigan Huron over the years. And in fact, since the 1980s, we've measured that the summer water surface temperatures have increased by about 2.5 degrees Celsius. That's very significant, especially if you're an organism that lives in the water. We've also seen from the 1970s, a decline in ice coverage of about uh, 71%. Now, again, ice is variable from year to year, but you'll notice the trending line there is towards less ice. And in fact, modelers are now forecasting that we will have completely ice-free years in the Great Lakes in the next couple of decades. We also are experiencing record high water levels in Lake Michigan Huron. And those, of course, this is a picture of uh, the, the Trans-Canada Highway out at Point O'Barrel, but you can see the water levels are right up. Um, this predominantly is a, a feature this year of an accumulation of precipitation in the Great Lakes Basin. If we look at the last three years of precipitation, we've never had a period of time in the entire record back to 1903, where we've had so much rain fall in the Great Lakes Basin. And if I put these little indicators and markers up in previous periods, you'll see that there is no other time in the recorded history of the water level or the precipitation rates where we've seen anywhere close to what we've experienced over the last three years. And if you also notice the trending of this data, it's upwards. So since 1903, the amount of precipitation in the Great Lakes Basin has been increasing over time. So this record high uh, precipitation over the last years is on top of already the highest levels of precipitation that we've seen. And so that's why we went from 2013 extreme low water levels to 2017 or 2019, 2020 extreme high water levels. That shortness of time between those lows and highs is what's called the, the rapid transition. And this is expected to become 
more normal or the new normal for the Great Lakes. And again, that's nothing that we can look back in the data record and see in the past. We also have wind speeds that have increased by about 5% per decade since the 1980s, which means today we have about 18% more wind speed than we did back in the 80s. And of course, this winter at Lionhead, with the high water levels and the increased energy from the wind blowing and creating more waves, their lighthouse was simply swept away off of its foundations. So the infrastructure that we built around the bay wasn't built anticipating these conditions. And that's something that we're going to have to deal with and you can deal with specifically when it comes to your own uh, property. The temperatures have increased by about 2.3 degrees since the 1950s. Uh, we have about 16 more frost-free days per season. The total amount of precipitation is up by about 14%. And the, the intense storms are 35% more common nowadays than they had been before. Kind of the one in 25 year or the one in 50 or the one in 100 year storms are happening 35% more often than they used to. So this is changing the dynamics uh, of the, the environment. And we're seeing more precipitation happen early in the spring and back into October, but through the summer conditions are a little drier. The forest is drying out and so it's more open to forest fires. This is a picture of the Perry Sound forest fire back in 2018. We've got uh, more wind speed. This particular slide is in, uh, in uh, Quebec after that uh, storm, the day that had six tornadoes go through Ottawa and Quebec. But you can see the pontoon boat up on the shore and the uh, tree that crashed through the roof of the cottage. We have more precipitation hitting the land and running off, taking nutrients with it, including overwhelming the municipal storm, uh, storm and sanitary systems, which actually end up bypassing their wastewater treatment plants and dumping raw sewage directly into our bay. There was about 7, 000, or 7 million liters of raw sewage dumped into uh, the Midland area in 2017 because of storm bypasses that occurred. And then finally, We've got uh, increasing temperatures, which not only allow more water vapor and larger storms up in the atmosphere, each one degree warming of the atmosphere allows 7% more water vapor to be taken up into the atmosphere. But also that same one degree of warming causes an increase of 10 to 12% in the number of lightning strikes. And so we're seeing a lot more opportunities in dry forests for ignition. And that can put pressures on survivability when we look at uh, our communities, both from a, a re real estate perspective, buildings, as well as uh, people. So the real question, once we accept that these things are changing and that there are going to be these increased energies that are coming to bear on our properties, what is it that we can do to become more resilient? And of course, resilient means the ability to either withstand or recover quickly from these difficult conditions. But really it comes down to how can we best protect our families if these conditions continue to get uh, stronger and stronger wind storms, more rain falling, potential for more forest fires, et cetera, right? It's about protecting our families. So the new realities are more extreme weather events, heavy rain, violent thunderstorms, hotter seasons, the flood season is now year round, uh, even winter time where we have more precipitation falling on frozen ground. Uh, we have uh, different water levels. There's more wind, which generates more wave action, more opportunities for uh, nutrient loadings into our waters, uh, which may impact our ability to drink the water from the bay if there's a toxic or nuisance algae bloom that ends up happening. Increasing storm water in combination with the sewage in our pipes and these old municipal wastewater treatment plants can also cause uh, increased nutrient releases into our waters. And those, depending on where you are in the bay, can have direct impacts on your ability to use the water. Uh, the cottages that were designed years ago were not designed with these new intense uh, wind loads uh, in mind. However, they were designed very robustly. And we know as uh, Georgian Bay cottagers and, and uh, residents and people that use the bay, that uh, there are storms and there's lots of wind and, uh, and we've all seen the way mother nature can uh, get mad and, uh, and put on a real show. 
So they have been pretty resilient, but the considerations you have to make as you look forward are that these new fluctuating water levels, water levels that you've never seen before, as we're experiencing now, are going to increase wear and tear on your properties and your infrastructure, docks and so on, and shorelines. Uh, there's much of what has been designed was not designed with these new environmental conditions uh, in mind. Conditions are different and they are expected to continue to get more challenging. We're only at the beginning of these impacts right now. Uh, we will be expecting to see them continue. And we have uh, summer temperatures that are expected to rise. So if you have uh, people that you're trying to keep uh, comfortable and safe, you may have to consider uh, different ways of uh, cooling. If your cottage is set up for passive cooling in the historic conditions, that might have been fine. But if temperatures are two or three degrees hotter than they have been historically, uh, you may not be able to provide the same comfort with that passive uh, cooling system. So all of these are considerations really that you need to keep in your mind as you look forward to making improvements to your properties or adding new uh, you know, features. And the one final point that I'll make is with these increasing uh, energy events, so bigger storms or bigger forest fires or things like that, they're going to impact more people. So if, if one cottage gets its roof blown off, it's really easy for the local resources, the contractors and so on, to come to bear with the materials that are needed and the labor that's needed to fix that. But if 100 cottages have their roofs blown off, that would overwhelm the resources that would be available in order to respond to that particular event. And so designing your buildings, thinking about it, making them more resilient to these impacts so that you don't have to experience those catastrophic failures will be really important in your own planning going forward. 